Do you not think that there is a fundamental part of us as human beings that needs religion? You could, you could say that there, there's a, a deep psychological need for religion. The comfort that you get from believing a falsehood um, is like a drug and, and it's a perfectly valid argument to say that, that there's everything to be said for the drug. I just want to make a distinction between what is true and what humanity needs and, and it may very well be that we do need false ideas in order to flourish and prosper. Mm. But I'm also interested in what's true. A lot of people are zipping their mouths because of um, a political pressure and if uh, people for political reasons are trying to deny that there really, are, there really is a binary separation between the two sexes, then that is anti-scientific, anti-rational and is a subversion of language, actually. Hey Francis, do you think financial platforms should be apolitical and not cancel people just because they don't agree with their politics? I'll never forgive what those absolute f***ing b****s that Tide Bank did to us! Now Francis, we don't know if our bank account was cancelled because of our politics. Give me five minutes in a room with them and I'll find out. What are you going to do, test your new jokes on them? Yes, and my Celine Dion impersonation. <sighs> don't want to see that. Uh, moving swiftly on, if you're looking for a crowdfunding platform, then you have to use Give, Send, Go. Give, Send, Go is a crowdfunding platform that is available in over 80 countries and provides a simple and easy ways to raise money online. They are politically neutral and don't remove campaigns based on political or ideological differences. We all know that a lot of crowdfunding platforms cancel people if they don't agree with their politics. The more we support companies providing alternative models, the more we weaken the power of cancel culture. What's more, Give, Send, Go is a free platform powered by donations, which means that you get to keep more of the money you raise. Other crowdfunding sites charge between 5 and 10%. 10% of the total money raised is a huge amount. Give, Send, Go can be used to raise funds for medical expenses, business ventures, personal needs, churches, non-profits, funeral costs, and much more. So let's take a stand. Don't give your business to companies that have made it clear they don't want you. Choose hope, choose freedom, choose Give, Send, Go. Go to www.givesendgo.com and check out a better alternative to crowdfunding. That's www.givesendgo.com and support the people who support freedom. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kisson. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. Our terrific guest today is a world famous evolutionary biologist, prolific author, and one of the four horsemen of the new atheist movement, Richard Dawkins. Professor Richard Dawkins, welcome to Trigonometry. Thank you very much. Oh, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. As I said, you're world famous, but for our audience who will already know some of your story, tell us a little bit about the background. Who are you? How, what's been your journey through life? How do you end up sitting here, a, a set of huge accomplishments throughout your life, uh, talking to us? How far do you want to go? Uh, um, back to birth or...? or, or um, as far back as you want to go. Yes. Actually. I was born in British colonial Africa, and uh, my father was in the colonial service. And um, they came, our, our family came to England when I was eight. And then I went to boarding school, and then Oxford. And at Oxford, I uh, was inspired by a world-famous biologist called Nico Tinbergen, who later got a Nobel Prize. And I did my doctorate under him, and have done, um, have been in academic life ever since. I mean, first of all, I went to University of California for two years, a very junior assistant professor, and then uh, I came back to Oxford, where I've been for all my life. Um, I was an, a tutor at Oxford doing the rather unique Oxford tutorial system. Uh, and I started writing books and I wrote a lot of books, uh, which for, for a general audience, which many of them sold very well. And then I was given a professorship of the public understanding of science, the Charles Simonia professorship of the public understanding of science. And then I had to, that was my job then, was to communicate science. And Pretty much that's what I've been doing, is communicating science. I've written about 16 or 17 books uh, and um, retired, ooh, about 10 years ago, now longer, 
uh, and carried on writing books, and that's where I am. It is indeed. And uh, one of your first, or was it the first book, The Selfish Gene? Yes. That's your very first book. That was a book that revolutionized as a young student. I remember reading it and understanding things that I never understood and some of the challenges then to the idea, to the evolutionary theory, for example, altruism, were beautifully addressed in that in a way that even someone who's not an expert could understand. Um, that, and you wrote that book almost half a century ago now, in 1976. I'm very pleased to hear you say how much that influenced you because um, it, it's, it, it, it sums up my attitude to biology. It's somewhat misunderstood, mainly by people who've read it by title only. <laughs> <laughs> think it's a book about selfishness or even an advocacy of selfishness, which of course it isn't. Um, quite the contrary. Um, and um, yes, it, it, it's coloured my, my whole um, career, really. And one of the things I wanted to ask you is, as I say, that was 1976 and nearly half a century ago. What things, what uh, discoveries have been made, what theories have been posited that you think in your field and also more broadly perhaps in science have emerged in that half century or nearly half century that you think are some of the most crucial things for human flourishing, human development that we've, we've made in that period? I suppose the main thing is the, the, the flourishing of uh, molecular biology because, I mean, it was, it was written long after Watson and Crick discovered the, the, the um, DNA double helix structure. But that led to the, to the unraveling of the genetic code and the realizing that biology is fundamentally digital. And um, that's what's really going now. In, in biology is dominated by this digital view of genetics. Everything is digital. And um, some people have asked me, has that changed the selfish gene? Would, would, I, would I change it if I rewrote it now because of the revolution in genomics? And I think I wouldn't. It's still, um, it's still valid as far as evolution is concerned. I mean, evolution is the differential survival of genes in gene pools, and that could have been said in the 1930s, actually. Uh, well, it pretty much was. So, Richard, my question is, how much does biology dominate our lives, as in our own lives? Does it dominate everything? Do, do we have free will, or is it, are we just purely a product of our genetics? Well, free will is a question that doesn't necessarily need a biologist to answer it. Um, it's a deep philosophical question, um, and it's not a question that I think you can answer by looking at genetics. If, I mean, if, if, if we have free will or we don't have free will, that won't be influenced by looking at genes. You, you can say, um, Nothing that I do is anything other than predetermined by, by the things that happen in, in the world, my, the molecules in, in, in my brain, everything is, is predetermined. Um, and genetics will not just be a part of that. So it's not really a question for a geneticist, it's a question for a philosopher, I suppose, um, or any scientist. And it's not a thing that, you'll, that, uh, that a geneticist has any specific um, input on. And is it, what, what revolution that can you see coming or is happening at the moment that you actually get excited by? Because that's the exciting thing about science, the changes, the innovation, the discoveries that we're seeing at the moment. Well, I mentioned molecular genetics and, and that's happening all the time. It's not, it's not a single revolution, it's just going on and on and on. Um, and so um, the fact that you can actually read very swiftly nowadays, you can actually read the genetic code of any animal. It's always the same genetic code, and what it says is in detail different. And so you can take any animals you like and read the genetic code, any people you like, and read the genetic code, and compare it letter by letter, line by line, just as you might compare two manuscripts. And that's an astonishing thing. I mean, that, that would have amazed Darwin, I think. And that means that you can reconstruct the whole tree of life, the whole pedigree, the whole family tree of all living things um, in, in minute detail. You can say which, is the, which pairs of animals and plants are the, most, are the closest cousins. You can estimate how far back they had a shared ancestor. That's, that's only an approximate estimate, but, but you can roughly lay out the complete history of the branching tree of life by looking at these molecular 
genetic um, sentences. Richard, and for someone like you who is a scientist and who is, uh, I, I think there's a sort of wondrous appreciation of all these things and the beauty of the natural world and so on. Uh, what are some, for, for our audience and, and for us actually, what are some of the practical applications that come out of these discoveries that we may not yet have seen when we go to the doctor, we may not yet have experienced in our own lives as a thing that's become part of it. What is coming as a product of this uh, steady, slow, but ongoing revolution? Hitherto, doctors have treated us all as pretty much the same. I mean, maybe a bit different, male and female, old and young, but apart from that, if you've got a certain disease, you get a certain, a certain medicine, a certain treatment. Um, what will come is when doctors are able to read the, um, they can in principle do it now, but it, when it becomes cheap enough that a, a doctor will know the genome of each patient, then the prescription that the doctor will give for any particular disease will vary depending upon the, uh, the genotype of the individual patient. Um, in a very sort of crude way, we already have this when certain particular diseases are, are known to be caused by certain particular genes. Um, but when everybody's patient, when everybody, every patient's genome is on file in the doctor's computer, they say, oh, okay, well, I look and yes, I see your genome, so you better have this, this drug. And then the next patient, oh, you better have this drug. Um, so I think that that's the main thing I can think of immediately off the top of my head in answer to your question. Mm -hmm. Richard, are you worried that, no, no, for, from a medical point of view, that sounds incredible. I'm like, of course, that, that is wonderful. That's what everybody should have access to. But do you worry as well that this type of information could be used in a, in a way to discriminate against people, for example, to prevent people getting health insurance because you might have like the BRCA gene and that means that you have a 90% chance of developing breast cancer. That's a big worry. And uh, it's one of the things that needs to be looked at very carefully because um, life insurance companies at, at present have a very crude way of um, doing their actuarial calculations. They look at your age, they look at whether you smoke, whether you drink to, to, to excess, that kind of thing. Um, but um, apart from that, we're all treated pretty much equally. And that means that, um, that, that those of us who are, um, who, are, who are healthier, in a sense, subsidizing those of us who, who, who get ill, and that, that's the way insurance works. Mm -hmm. if, if it came to it that um, genetic uh, knowledge enabled actuarial calculators to say, okay, he's, he's, got, he's got another 25 years to live, he's got only 15 years to live, um, then life insurance would become impossible. I don't think it'll come to that because it's not that predictable. But nevertheless, um, there would have to be careful regulation. I'm not sure how that would work. I suppose to prevent insurance companies getting access to data which, which would have to be kept confidential, that would be one way to do it. Uh, another way, I, I'm not quite sure what, how, what the legality of, of it would be, but that, that is a big worry. And, and also as well, what it brings into, I mean, the term designer babies is, is used. I, I think it's more of a kind of tabloid description, but we know what we mean. Where people, where babies are then having screened for certain genetics and certain genes are, taking, are taken out or eliminated or played with. Do you think that science is playing God or do you think that's actually where we need to get to as a species, so thereby eliminating certain illnesses, diseases? I think it's hard to find an objection to eliminating diseases. So I think as long as that's used not for making designer babies, but for um, screening against hereditary diseases, it seems to me that that's, it would be hard to object to that. Um, Richard, sorry to interrupt, yes. do you not think there's a moral conundrum there? Because it kind of depends where you draw that line, doesn't it? For example, if you have a baby that's, I don't know, has a higher risk of cancer. Now, I, I have a, a, a young son. I wouldn't want him to have, have a higher risk of cancer. But if I could then, you know, select him from a number of fetuses and discard the others, wouldn't that be maybe perhaps too far going in that direction? Well, I don't think necessarily so. Um, I suppose the way it might work would be something like this. In IVF, in, in vitro fertilization, um, a, a woman is um, given hormone treatment to superovulate, so she gets maybe a dozen eggs. And the, do the dozen eggs are all in, in a Petri dish. And what happens at present is that the doctor picks out one of these 
eggs at random, one, well, they, they all get fer fertilized if they can, picks out one of the zygotes at random and re-implants it in the woman. Well, um, if the, instead of picking the zygote at random, you, you, you examine the genes, and this can be done when it reaches, say, the eight cell stage, so you, you let them develop to the eight cell stage, so they are eight cell embryos, and then you can take out one cell of the, of the eight and look at the genes of that, and it doesn't damage it. And you say, oh, okay, this one has the gene for hemophilia, and this one doesn't. Mm. Why on earth would you choose at, at, at random if you know that, some, that half of them have the, have the haemophilia gene and half of them don't? Obviously, it makes moral sense to pick one of the half, one of the 50% that do not have the gene for haemophilia, whatever it might be. I suppose the question that it brings into, and this is part of the other conversation we want to have with you um, in terms of atheism and religion, it brings into question uh, life. What is life? Is, is an eight-cell zygote life? Can it be discarded? Uh, is the, that, that's where the moral conundrum comes in. I have no time for those, that kind of argument about is this a human, human life or, or You don't? Not? Really? No. Why not? Well, because this eight-cell zygote has no feeling, it has no nervous system, it has no capacity to suffer, no capacity to feel pain. Um, so that there's the mean, no, no moral difficulty at all in choosing. You're going to pick one of them anyway. You've got a, a dozen of them. And the, and the 11 that you, that you don't choose are going to be flushed away anyway. So um, you've already taken that moral decision in a way. It's a question of whether you choose one at random or whether you choose the one that, that does not have the lethal or sub, sub no, But gene. what I mean is once you've created that selection process, given that parents would want their children to be happy, but also clever and oh, that, charismatic. Now you've, now you've moved on to quite yes, a bit different yeah. topic. Yeah, yeah. No, no, Now yeah. you've moved on to... But that's where I was going with okay, it. Right? Okay, okay. So, and that's, I think, the core of Francis' yeah. question yeah, yeah. too is, if we've got the opportunity to select the optimum baby for us, are we not going to end up in a position where parents are encouraged to go down that path? Well, yes. Incentivized even. But you've changed the subject. And I, I, I was talking about the removal well, of, of, yeah. of, of... I'm, I'm not trying to catch you out. No, I'm no, trying no, to no. Get it's to a very in interesting yeah. question. Yeah. And, and then, then you can say something like, um, if it became possible to know that of these, of these dozen zygotes that we've got, mm. um, some of them have a gene for musical genius mm -hmm. and some of them don't, um, we're nowhere near that at the moment, but, but if, if in the future that, that came about, then would you worry about parents who say, I want my child to, to be a great musician or a great composer, a great mathematician? Um, and that's very interesting. That's a more difficult moral dilemma. Um, if, if you object to that, then I might say to you, why do you object to that when you don't object to parents in kind of even forcing their child to practice the piano. Mm -hmm. See, you know, you, you haven't done your music practice today. Get on with it. You're supposed to practice because the only way you will become a great pianist is by practicing six hours a day, whatever it is. Um, why would you think that is uh, okay when you would not think it okay to pick out a zygote from a Petri dish which contains a genetic predisposition to be a great musician. I'm not answering the question, but I'm saying that in a way, these sorts of moral questions can best be answered by comparison with other, other things. And I'm just comparing this case, asking the sort of question a moral philosopher might, might ask. Um, what's the difference between encouraging a child to practice the piano and giving the child a head start by giving it the, gene of the, of the ones that are available in the Petri dish in an IVF situation um, to become a, a musician. Well, I suppose the problem with, with the, the answer to that is we come back into the realm of religion and morality because I think at the core of it is the idea that the creation of life is some kind of random miracle. It's supposed to be sort of it's it's not supposed to be is a word that I've introduced, of course. But if we if we call it a miracle, um, it, it's supposed to be random to some extent. It's supposed to be down to chance. When you, when we start interfering with that selection process, instinctively, I I, don't, I can't explain it. Perhaps I feel a certain there's something off about that. 
for me. I know that's not a very r rational or scientific argument, but I do think that's one a lot of people share, actually. Well, it's not you. rational. It, no, I, mean, I, I, sounds, I acknowledge that. It, yeah. it sounds as though you're religious. It does, <laughs> it does, which I'm not, interestingly, but I feel that that is probably how a lot of people do think about it. Yes, I suppose they do. Um, I think it's, it, more of a worry would be if some mad dictator, some kind of Hitler, started using these techniques and, and mandating, you know, the, the selection of blonde, blue-eyed, Aryan, you know, um, the sort of thing Hitler might have, might have selected. Um, I was talking about more giving parents the opportunity to have their, um, to do their IVF in a, in a non-random way. I mean, to, I, I can sort of see that both ways. I don't, I'm, I, but on the other hand, if, it, if you have a dictator who says, we want to breed in this country a race of people who are, who are of such and such a type, um, that I think is deeply sinister. I would agree with you. Well, what would you say as well, Richard? Because I think about this a lot. So when I was a teacher, I taught, for instance, uh, children who were on the autistic spectrum, and they were quite far on the autistic spectrum, so they were nonverbal. But I also saw children who were autistic, and as a result of their autism, some of them were highly gifted in mathematics and, and would go on to be scientists, physicists, etc., etc. You see artists who have depression, for example, very severe depression, but that almost gives them an insight into the human condition and human suffering. My worry is with this, we go, okay, we're going to get rid of depression, we're going to get rid of autism. And then you could argue, well, look, we're going to get rid of, we're going to lower suicide rates. As a result of that, we're going to, nonverbal autism will be eradicated completely. But also, aren't we going to get rid of the outliers, the, yeah. the, the, the great thinkers, yeah. the people who look at the world in a different way that move our, our species forward? That's an excellent point. Um, and, and it's one that I should have come on to any, anyway. Yeah. Um, when you do any kind of selection for any one characteristic, you're in danger of having side effects which you, ne which you never thought of. Mm -hmm. So if, if you select for, um, to, to, to remove some kind of psychological pro problem, then it might, could well be that you're then having a side effect of, of, of never getting any, any genius mathematicians of something of that sort, is what you're saying. I think that's a very good point. And, um, it's, it's one of the problems with any kind of eugenic selection is that, is that you, you don't know what the, what the byproducts are going to be of the selection that you're, that you're engaged upon. And that's what I mean when, when you have a dictator who says, we're going to breed for such and such. You see this with, with breeding animals. You, you breed for racehorses who have very, can run very fast and, and they break their legs. I mean, they've, they're, 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 they become more vulnerable to um, leg breakages because you're breeding for one thing, namely speed. And in nature, that doesn't happen. In, in nature, it's, it would be counterbalanced by selection against breaking the legs. Well, you're only using a, a human example, which is much more serious, um, where um, geniuses, outliers, as you rightly said, um, are quite likely to be selected against if you naively um, go for re removing certain psychological uh, pr problems. So there's, there's, there is something to be said for letting nature take its course. Mm -hmm. But I think I come back to the negative things of these, these sort of genetic d diseases, which are, which are, I think anybody would agree, are undesirable, like hemophilia. Um, and and it, seem, it seems to me that taking a moral, le uh, letting that your moral con concerns overspill into forbidding the removal of genetic diseases like haemophilia that, that, that are obviously negative in all respects, um, that, 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 that's going too far. And Richard, we have a lot of scientists saying that they're worried about where science is going, the state of science in general, free speech in universities, scientists no longer being able to, allowed to explore certain avenues. How do you see the field of sciences at the moment? Are you optimistic or are you a little bit more cautious? Um, what examples are you thinking of where scientists are not allowed to? Well, we, we for instance, when it comes to talking about bi uh, the sexes. Yes. And saying, you know, the, 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 there's differences between the sexes. Yes. Investigating the differences between the sexes. Yes. Certain scientists would say, look, I, I don't feel able to investigate that anymore because 
people will complain, people will say certain things about me that, you know, that I'm denying the existence of trans people, for yes. example. Yes, I think you're right that um, not just scientists, but, but um, a lot of people are zipping their mouths um, because of um, a political pressure of the sort that you're saying. Um, and it, it is important, I think, for scientists to, to be honest and to uh, use language precisely. And in the particular case of sex that, that you mentioned, it's one of the few cases where there really is a, 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 a bifurcation, a binary bifurcation. There really are two sexes. And <laughs> scientists have to, have to work un, under that, that fact. And if uh, people, for political reasons, are trying to deny that there really, are, there really is a binary separation between the, between the two sexes, then that is anti-scientific, anti-rational, and is a, a subversion of language, actually. Richard, uh, I, I actually didn't want to make this conversation in any way about the cultural discussions around that issue. But since, since we've come to it, do you sit there and sometimes have to pinch yourself that you, one of the most eminent evolutionary biologists in our society, go on the, on, on the mainstream media and you are asked to talk about the fact that there's men and women. Do, do, you not, yes. do, you not feel, do you not experience that as like a gigantic regression? I do, I, I, I do, because um, I, I've, um, one of the, the main points I, I, I like to make is that very often, um, I, I call it the tyranny of the discontinuous mind, where we're far too fond of making discriminations um, things like, um, well, we were talking a bit, a bit earlier about um, embryos. When does, when does an embryo become human? Is there a, a particular moment when an embryo becomes human? No, there isn't. It's a continuum. It's a sliding scale. There are sliding scales everywhere. We in universities, when we examine students, we give them a degree, first, second, two, one, two, two, third. And we, we, we insist upon making a divide between one class and another, when we know perfectly well that the top of one class is closer to the bottom of the one above than it is to the bottom of its own class. And yet, the information about this sliding scale, this actually in this bell-shaped distribution in this case, um, is thrown away when we divide, we insist upon making di divides. So, um, the tyranny of the discontinuous mind is one of my catchphrases. And if I look around and say, is there any case where there really is a proper divide, a real, where there really is no spectrum. And sex is, a, is the one thing I can think of. There really isn't a spectrum. You really are either male or female. And so um, I do have to pinch myself when, um, for once, uh, it, it goes the other way. I mean, there, there really is no spectrum there. And um, yes, I, I, I do have to think. And myself. where do you think this regression, if you agree with my use of it, where does that come from? Well, in certain social sciences, um, they've been very influenced by what they call postmodernism. I don't really know what postmodernism is. In fact, I think the so-called postmodernists don't know either. But I think it's something to do with um, the words meaning something that is determined by politics and, and <laughs> you, 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 don't, you don't actually have a, 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 a fixed meaning of words like male and female because the, there's an intellectual movement in, in the social sciences that says that everything is a social con construct yeah. and male and female is a social construct. There's no real, real validity to the con to difference in male and female. It's all a social construct. Um, or cultural relativism, the idea that um, um, different cultures have completely different ways of classifying the, the world, and so and so it's just our white Western way of looking at things that um, that says that, that there are there's a divide between males and females or something like like that. And Richard, with this social uh, constructivism thing, my sense is that is uh, the erosion of the concept of truth itself. Is, is that too strongly put? Or would you I think it's absolutely right to say that it is the erosion of the concept of truth. I mean, it, it is valid to say that language evolves and, mm -hmm. and what words mean today is not the same as what they meant 200 years ago necessarily or 1,000 years ago. Um, and so we have to accept the fact that words change their, their, their meaning. But we also have to live in a world where um, we have to be able to communicate. And so yes. we have to be able to say that there are certain words that 
that, that at, at present means, means such and such. At, at present, black means black and white means white and blue means blue. And, it, and it, if, if that changes in 100 years, that's okay. But for the moment, we, we've got to use words that everybody understands. And words like male and female are pretty clear in everybody's mind what that means. And um, to come along and say, oh, that's just a social construct, um, is subversion of language, subversion of truth. I think you're right. Do you think that this is a religious belief, Richard? I think it has a lot in common with, religi with religious belief. Um, it's different in that it doesn't invoke anything supernatural, but it's very similar in the ways that heretics are hunted down. We've seen this in Oxford recently where Kathleen Stark has been, has been um, vigorously, not almost violently, sometimes they, they are violently hunted down. Then there's actually rather detailed parallels with, with religious um, dogma. Um, the, the doctrine of um, original sin. Um, Christians, especially Catholics, believe that um, we're all born in sin. We're all, we're all in, we all inherit the sin of Adam. Um, although they no longer think Adam ever existed, but somehow they sort of managed to talk, go on about talking about the sin of Adam. Um, and so we all, the moment we're born, we're born in sin. We have to be baptized to be cleansed of sin, that, that kind of thing. And I think we see that in the collective guilt that all white people are supposed to inherit because of slavery. And, and, and even if they, obviously they have no direct connection with slavery, maybe even if they never had an ancestor, most of them probably did, but. Um, and we are all c collectively guilty for what people of, of our type did in some past age, and that is, Original sin. I mean, it's exactly like original sin. Francis, may I jump in just yes. very quickly, Richard? You said there's nothing supernatural. Do you not think that the claim that you can change your sex by means of incantation is a claim that is supernatural? I mean, yes. I mean, you could you can make that case. Um, it's not quite supernatural in the same sense as as believing in gods or believing in in fairies. Um, but yes, it's sort of like that. Um, let's take in another religious. Example: the Catholic belief in transubstantiation, where the consecrated wine and bread becomes the blood and body of Christ. And the, the way they put this is, is to use the Aristotelian idea of substance, essence, something, and accidental. So, so um, um, Aristotle made the distinction between the, the, the real substance and, and, the, and the accidentals. And so they, they say, that, well, the accidentals of wine, it's, it's still wine in this sort of accidental sense, but in real substance, it becomes the blood of Christ. And that's the verbal trick that they use to, to justify this ridiculous idea that the blood becomes, sorry, the wine becomes the blood of Christ. Um, so yes, that's very, very similar to, you're quite right, that's very, very similar to, to say that it's an incantation that, that you say, I stand up and say, I am a woman, therefore I am a woman, therefore everything about me is, is a woman. You're not allowed to misgender me, you're not allowed to, to say anything against the idea that I'm a woman. That's very, very similar to, to the accidental and real substance argument of Catholics. In, the accidentals may, may, may say I'm a man, I still have a penis, but in my real substance, I'm a woman. And that's very, very similar, yes, quite Ri right. Richard, now you, you're obviously a very famous atheist and you've written fantastic works talking about your atheism. Do you not think that there is a fundamental part of us as human beings that needs religion? Yes, very possibly there is. Um, it doesn't mean it applies to everybody. It, it, it may mean that there's just a, um, a it, it, it's quite difficult to eradicate when you have something as fundamental as that. And, and yes, um, and I suppose a psychologist could delve into that and, and say something like, you, we all need um, to believe in something higher than ourselves. We have a desperate need to believe that we're not going to just fizzle out when we die. Um, so yes, uh, you, could, you could say that there, there's a, a deep psychological need for religion. 
It doesn't mean everybody has it. It doesn't mean that, that you can't get out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but there's probably something like that to explain it. And because being critical of organized religion as you were, was there ever, did you ever think that you might, that you went too far with your criticisms in, of, of God in, in particular? Or would you look back on it and go, no, I was absolutely justified in what I said at that particular time? Um, I, I've always tried to seek the truth and uh, I've, I've never wanted to be, um, I never wanted to upset people, um, but I just think that we should be free to argue points. And um, so uh, I don't think I've gone too far. You could possibly dig out cases where, where you, you might challenge me and I might say, yes, perhaps I did go too far there. Um, but um, I think in general, I've always just tried to be loyal to the truth. I think that religious claims are not trivial, and I think that they're very interesting. Um, it, it, it's, in a way, it's one of the biggest questions, that perhaps the biggest question there is in science is, is does some kind of supernatural intelligence lurk behind the universe? Is the universe a planned um, entity that, 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 that a super, supernatural being conceived? I mean, that's a profound scientific question. If it's true, then, we're, then the entire universe we're looking at is a very different kind of universe from one where there's nothing behind it. Um, and so it's a very, very deep scientific question um, and I think the, the answer is clear, there is none. But I'm, I, I don't write it off as something trivial. I don't write it off as a case where you can just say, um, it's not interesting. Of course it's interesting. Um, it's interesting. A scientist has got to be interested in this, this suggestion that the sort of universe we're studying is a planned, designed universe. That's a very, very different kind of universe. So it's a very, it's a very deep question. It is a very deep question because I, I sense, and I'm not a scientist, that the more you discover about the world, the more you learn about the beauties, the details, the intricacies, the way things are interlocked together, isn't maybe a part of you that thinks this can't have been an accident? There must be something else here. It's very, very tempting to say, yes, it, it, everything works so perfectly together. And the, the, for, for me as a biologist, the complexity of life, the, the enormous panoply of, of plants and animals and forests and birds and insects, everything working together. No, it's, it, it's a huge, beautiful construction. And what, for me, what is absolutely marvelous is that nevertheless, there is a perfectly decent explanation that it did all come about without, without planning. So one of the beauties of it is precisely that we now can explain it or we're well on our way to, it, to explaining it without invoking any kind of supernatural intelligence. And it is a great temptation because um, we are so used to the idea, looking at our own machines, looking at things that we've made like computers and cars and planes. And um, these are clearly the result of design, deliberate design, deliberate construction, and when you look at something like a bird's wing, and compare it with an aeroplane's wing, the temptation is huge to say, oh, they must both be designed. And it was the genius of Darwin to break away from that and say, actually, no, there is a proper explanation. There is a, a, a materialistic explanation for that. Um, and so, so the flip side of, of, the, of the temptation is that when you've overcome the temptation, and worked out that it is possible to explain it in simple scientific terms. I, I really mean simple because it, the idea, the idea, Darwin's idea is a deeply simple idea. And yet, given enough time, the Darwinian idea of natural selection, given enough time, can build up to prodigies of complexity and beauty and the illusion of design. And that's a, a that's a measure of the genius of Darwin to see that. And Richard, in your book, The Blind Watchmaker, you make that point, I think, beautifully. 
And, and I do actually think that just slightly, no disrespect to France, is probably one of the weaker arguments against your position. What I think is a strong, strong argument is the one he made earlier. And this is about the psychological need people have for religion, but also at the level of society. And this is really something I want to get into with you. Uh, uh, Noah Yuval Harari, for example, in his book, Sapiens, his central argument is that the reason Homo sapiens were able to outcompete other uh, species of human, uh, humanids, or uh, humanoids, humanids? Hominins. Ho hom <laughs> See, I got both wrong, <laughs> hominins, was that um, they were able to build shared myths that allowed them to create tribes that went beyond the, the 150 limit of sort of being able to know everybody. And when we look at the world today, uh, our generation, I, uh, when you're not in the room, I sometimes refer to us as, you know, the children of Dawkins and the children of Hitchens in the sense that you took away with your beautiful books our ability to have that illusion that the world around us is, you know, this God-created mysterious place for which there's no other explanation. But as I look around at the world with its inability to agree on what words mean, uh, what people call now the crisis of meaning, where a lot of people are kind of lost. They don't know what the purpose and meaning of their life is. Do you worry that maybe the truth is that for Richard Dawkins, your worldview is perfect because you are Richard Dawkins. You're able to be inspired by science, by the beauty of the natural world, by the beauty of the universe. But for a lot of other people, what they actually need is not necessarily the belief in God so much as the social function that religion used to fulfill, which is to bind us together with a set of shared values and a set of shared morals and a set of shared ideas about what it means to be human, what it means to relate to other people. And without that, we are lost and therefore we create these new religions that sort of tear our society apart. I think that's very interesting and I, I, I'm um, rather persuaded by Harari's argument. Um, and, but, but notice what you've just done. I mean, you, you, you said um, maybe humans need religion, maybe they need something to bind society together and function as a unit and so on. And maybe they do, but that doesn't make it true. Oh, I agree with you. And of course you do. Um, and, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, How modest of you. <laughs> but, no, I mean, it, 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 it's just a, it, that you, you can make a, a, an utterly watertight argument where humanity needs something, which yes. is false. Yeah. Oh, um, I, fine. And, and, and uh, um, I just want to make a distinction between what is true and what humanity needs. And, and it may very well be that, um, that, that, that we do need false ideas in order to flourish and prosper. Mm. But I'm also interested in what's true. And um, so, I mean, I don't want to get involved in that sort of snobbish idea that, that, that it's okay for, for us intellectuals, but, but hoi polloi um, need religion. Um, but I wouldn't consider myself an intellectual, mm -hmm. so I am, I am the hoi polo in this, in this context. But I, I'm just saying to you, I, I, to me, truth is a supreme value, and I agree with you. But at the same time, to me, the cohesion of our society, the fact that people are able to live a life of meaning and purpose, uh, they're able to connect to other human beings and be fulfilled in their lives and know what to do. And, you know, you don't have people who are disappointed with the way that their life has gone because of the choices that they made because they didn't have someone encouraging them down a particular path. Yeah. That to me is also very tragic, as, as tragic as the erosion of the concept of truth. And I feel there's a balance to be struck there. That's yes. what I'm saying. Yes, I, I think that's, that's a very good point. And, and um, uh, I, perhaps I should say, accepting the possibility of that, I might also say that actually there's something wonderful about truth itself. Of course. And um, so you can, you can lead a very, very fulfilled life in the search for truth. Uh, and, um, but so that's my argument. You can. Yeah. You can. You are a scientist who spent his whole life pursuing the truth with a microscope and whatever other tools you use, right? I haven't. I can't, that's not what I can do, and that's not what a lot of people can do. It's not because they're stu more stupid than you, it's just because they're not scientifically minded. Maybe they, they're they musicians or whatever, and, and, and they don't have that same mindset as you do. They don't have the same brain as you do. That's the argument. I, I can't get involved in using myself as a... <laughs> um, 
but but um, I, I just want to repeat that 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 you don't act well. Okay, you don't actually have to be a working scientist. You can you can you can revel in the beauty of scientific understanding, just as you can revel in music without actually being able to play an instrument. Um, and um, there is there is Im immense fulfilment to be had in appreciation of understanding of the universe in which you live and why you live here and why you exist that that's a, a wonderful thing and i i don't want to accept the idea that uh, only certain people are capable of doing that you probably have a microscope in order to do that you don't you can read books you can see the cosmos television series you can see david attenborough's films um and there's huge satisfaction of, a, of the kind of thing that I suppose religion aspired to do in past centuries. Um, and uh, you, can, you can get it by almost worshipping, not worshipping in, in the sense of worshipping anything supernatural, but the, 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 the wonder of your own existence and the process that has given rise to, your, to, to, to you, that has led to your existence, which wonder of wonders, we, knew, we now pretty much understand. I mean, we, we, it's a privilege to be alive in the 21st century and to be in a position to just read a few books and see a few television documentaries and understand why you exist. That's never happened before. Do you have a website or do you plan to have a website? Because if you do, then EasyDNS is a company for you. EasyDNS is the perfect domain name registrar provider and web host for you. They have a track record of standing up for their clients, whether it be cancel culture, de-platform attacks, or overzealous government agencies. He knows about that. So will you in a second. <laughs> EasyDNS have rock solid network infrastructure and fantastic customer support. They're in your corner, no matter what the world throws at you unless it's your ex-girlfriend, in which case you're on your own. <laughs> you know about that. <laughs> Move your domains and websites over to EasyDNS right now. All you've got to do is go to easydns.com forward slash triggered. That's easydns.com forward slash triggered. Use our promo code, which is also triggered, and get 50% off the initial purchase. Sign up for their newsletter, Access of Easy, which tells you everything you need to know about technology, privacy, and censorship. I think the thing that the thing that religion gives people is a sense of safety almost. So for instance, if when, when somebody is very ill and maybe they have cancer and they don't know if they're going to live or not, this knowledge that there is a supreme being looking after them or that there's somewhere that they're going to go afterwards provides someone with a deep sense of comfort in the darkest moments of their life. And whilst I agree with everything that you said about science and discovery and the wonder of looking at the universe, I don't think that provides that particular emotion. Do you see? No, it's probably true. Uh, and um, again, you can say um, that, that the, the solace that you get, the comfort do you, that you get from a belief, even if it's false, is nevertheless is comforting. Mm. Um, uh, you've probably read Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, yes. where, where um, um, the, uh, towards the end, the, the Mr. Savage, the, the, the person who's brought from the reservation and who, is, who has actually got access to reading Shakespeare and things, he has an argument with the world controller about whether dulling people's senses with soma, with the drug that they, that they all have to make them feel good, um, comparing that with um, the, the um, depth of emotion that you can get by reading Romeo and Juliet or, or, or Othello. Um, and the savage is advocating Shakespeare and the world controller is advocating the pacification of people with, 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 the, with this drug that makes them all, all feel good. In a way, the, the comfort that you get from believing a falsehood um, is like a drug. And, and it's a perfectly valid argument to say that, that there's everything to be said for the drug. Mm. And there are, of course, real drugs you can take. It doesn't have to be a, f a false belief. You can, you can take soma equivalent.
Well, well that, I mean, that is absolutely true. It, it's, you know, it's that drug is, is such a powerful thing. You, you see, I can, I've got to the stage in my life, Richard, where I can tell a lot of the time if someone is religious because there's a lightness about them. There's almost the, 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 that kind of existential dread which hangs off atheists, and maybe I'm projecting somewhat, they don't seem to have. Not my experience. Um, uh, I, I would say you have the same lightness, yeah, by the way. Yeah, actually, yes. Okay, I, I, I'm not sure that that would stand up to a serious investigation. <laughs> <laughs> a controlled experiment may not well, show that. Well, okay, yeah. I mean, we've got nothing but anecdotes. Um, yeah. Anecdotes I've heard, I, I was close to somebody who um, was in, was look, look, looked after an old people's home. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said that um, the people who, who are really afraid of death are the Catholics. Um, and that seems surprising in a way, but remember there's hell as well as heaven. I mean, no. And, and, and um, there's purgatory before you get to, to either. Um, and so um, I think we need a bit, a bit more investigation before, before we talk about <laughs> this lightness of being that you, you get from... from um, uh, Richard, and, and what about you? Because uh, you're in your 80s now, you're in extremely great shape, both physically and mentally. But you are in, you know, you are in your 80s. And so the moment is coming uh, for you at some point, I hope very, very far away. Uh, an atheist uh, deathbed conversion is not a thing that's unheard of. Uh, how, how do you have that it, lightness? It, 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 it's a, it, often it's a myth. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a, myth, <laughs> there's a myth that Darwin had, had a deathbed conversion, which is, which is utterly false. Um, uh, I guess what I'm asking is, how do you have the lightness that you have? How do you face death? I think that, um, well, uh, I think it was Mark Twain said, um, I was dead for billions of years before I was born and never suffered the smallest inconvenience. Um, it's going to be just the same as before we were, we were born. We were, we, were, we were not there during the whole of the Cambrian and the Ordovician and, and, and the age of the dinosaurs and everything. And we're going to be not there after we're dead. So we have this brief time in the sun to have a full and fulfilled life, which is what I am doing and intend to go on doing until I can't anymore. Um, the, the process of dying, as opposed to being dead, the process of dying is often very disagreeable. <laughs> uh, when, when, that is the most British <laughs> understatement that when, when we're ever not made. allowed to we're not allowed the privilege that a dog has of being taken to the vet and put painlessly to sleep maybe I should identify as a dog <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's the title of the episode if, I, Richard. If, I, if, I, if, if I'm not allowed to to go to the vet and ask to be put down or if the, or if the vet refuses to put me down I could sue him for misspeciesing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, okay, I mean, if there is something frightening about being dead, it's the idea of eternity. Yes. And eternity is a sort of frightening idea, whether it's before you're born or after you're born, it's a kind of frightening idea. Um, and so the best way to spend eternity, therefore, is under a general anaesthetic, <laughs> which is exactly what's going to happen. Uh, Richard, I was going, <laughs> you were saying that it was, uh, under a general anaesthetic. Do you, was there part of you when you were at the forefront of the new atheist movement that thought you were going to defeat religion, that you, mm. but using facts and scientific reason and logic, you were going to you know, defeat all of these different religions? I was never that optimistic. <laughs> um, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think I ever thought that. And, and, and there was no, no movement, I mean, would, you know, would the, would, would, a, a four, four or five books came out at roughly the same time but by coincidence, but there was a, never an actual movement. I think it's a journalistic invention. Were you uh, close with Christopher Hitchens? Well, I, I didn't know him that well. I, I, I met him from time to time. Um, I, I had a long interview with him for New Statesman. I think it was the last interview he ever had before he died in, in, in a in Texas where he was um, being treated. And um, so, yes, but I, I wasn't one of his close circle of friends like, like Martin Amos and 
Salman Rushdie. And what were your thoughts or impressions of him? What kind of person was he? Oh, um, immensely eloquent, immensely erudite. Um, the most eloquent speaker I ever heard, I think. Uh, and um, and a, a huge loss. I mean, wonderful intellect, wonderful command of English language, command of facts, um, command of historic and literary reference. Richard, we, we were time, we were before I, I asked you about the atheism question, you sounded as if you were pro-euthanasia, are you, in order to alleviate suffering at the end of someone's life? With, the, with safeguards. I think you do need safeguards against, um, you know, let, let's get rid of granny sort of thing. <laughs> 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 Um, I've got to get on the housing ladder somehow, Richard. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think th th there have to be safeguards, and, and there can be, and, and, and the, um, the legal scholars look into the possibility. But, but given, given that, uh, yes, I am. I, th I think that um, um, we, we should have the right to um, end our lives when we want to. Um, I know of, of cases, I've personally come across cases where somebody has committed suicide in a not very pleasant way um, because they still had the power to do so. And if they had waited any longer, then they would have been incapable of, of doing the act themselves. And therefore their lives were actually made shorter by suicide because they didn't have the comfort of knowing that if at any time later on, when they were no longer physically capable of killing themselves, they could ask a doctor to do it for them. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, Richard, I want to, before we wrap up and ask you our final question and go to locals where our audience get to ask you questions, I want to ask you a couple of uh, just like uh, one-off questions, which is, one of the things that a lot of people are talking about now is the emergence of AI. Uh, it's not your field of expertise. Do you have any thoughts on the development of AI as we currently have it? I um, had a go with chat, GPT, chat, GPT, chat, GPT, GPT, GPT yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I was quite interested in that. Um, its factual knowledge is lamentable. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, it's actually quite comic. Uh, um, I happen to be interested in J.B.S. Haldane, um, who, who was a great, bi great biologist. I can't remember how, why, why that subject came up. And um, his wife, his third wife, I think, was a woman called Helen Spurway, who was a geneticist. Um, and I can't remember why I asked a question about Helen Spurway, but I did. And it said, Helen Spurway was married to Richard Dawkins. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I was sort of flabbergasted by this. And um, later on, I th about three weeks later, I thought, well, I'll check up again. So I said, um, who was Helen Spurway married Who was Helen Spurway married to? And they said, Aldous Huxley, which again was false. Um, so I don't understand quite why its factual knowledge of silly details like that is so poor, because Anybody can Google something now. Mm -hmm. I mean, why didn't they just Google uh, Helen Spurway and, and come up with the correct answer, which is that she's married to, she was married to J.B.S. Haldane. I mean, it, it's a, it would take about two seconds for a human to do it, let alone for, for AI to do it. Mm -hmm. So um, that's just, a, I suppose, a vaguely amusing anecdote about factual knowledge. Um, it is said that, there, that, that people are using it to write essays and things like that. It, it is pretty impressive. Um, um, you, if, you, if you ask it to um, give a, to, 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 to write an essay about something in the style of somebody or other, mm -hmm. it produces something pretty impressive. Or you, I, we could probably ask it to write an essay on uh, evolution in the style of William Shakespeare and, and, and it would produce a pretty good pastiche of Shakespeare's style. Um, I'm not quite sure, I haven't really been into, as you rightly said, I haven't really been into the 
things that worry people about it. But but I, I'm I'm alive to the possibility that there are grave dangers in something getting out of hand, getting out of control. And and do you have some sense of how that might play out? Not really. I need to do more reading on the subject. I think. I mean, I need to read some of the people who aren't seriously worried about it, and whom I respect. Well, one of the concerns, there was an article, now I don't know how accurate it was, but it is an example whereby they were training some kind of military system of AI to choose targets, and then a human operator had the final decision over whether that target should be struck or not with a missile. Uh, and allegedly, according to this article, the because the human operator sometimes denied a strike on valid targets for other reasons, the AI decided that the human operator was the obstacle in the way of destroying the targets that needed destroying, and in the simulation, attacked the human operator, right? That is a sort of, so the argument about AI at least seems to be that it's a baby now and it's getting the wives of the people wrong because it's still learning how to walk and talk, but eventually it could grow up to be like a Hitler or whatever, you know what I mean? Yes, I think, I think that's a very valid point and I could imagine um, a, some kind of AI asked to determine what would be the best thing for the, for the sum of happiness would be to exterminate everybody because, exactly. because yes. we're all miserable. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I, as I said, I need to read more about it. I, th I think it's, it's interesting and um, I, I'm in favour of uh, looking cautiously into the future and saying for about all sorts of things, what, what kind of dilemmas are likely to arise in the future what kind of problems is scientific progress, and this is one, AI is just one example, scientific progress likely to, to raise in future. We need to be prepared in advance for what's going to happen. And I, I certainly have read enough to know that um, AI is capable of doing things which are really beyond our dreams at the moment, and, and who knows where that will lead. And that other question I wanted to ask you in this part of the interview is this. On the balance of probability, are we alone in the universe? And second part to that question, if we're not, is it wise to seek contact with those other sentient life forms? I think exist? the balance of probability is that we are not alone. Um, if we are alone in the universe, then that has interesting implications. It means that the origin of life on our planet was a supremely improbable event so improbable that we're probably wasting our time trying to work out how it happened. Um, but I don't believe that, and I, I do actually believe that we are one of many um, uh, life forms in the universe, and I would love to know what, what the others are like. I mean, I'd, I'd love to know how unique we are. I'd love to know, I, I, I could make a few predictions. I mean, I think I could predict that um, there's going to, it's going to be Darwinian, um, it's going to be, um, it's going to have some kind of digital genetics. Um, there's got to be, there's got to be a, a very accurate genetic system. We could make predictions of that, of that sort. Um, is it wise to, uh, well, first of all, there's a very, there's a big distinction between life and sentient life, um, uh, intelligent life. Uh, the um, intelligent life is, a, a big step further, and so if there's, there's probably a lot more life around than there is intelligent life around. It's, it's a big barrier to get through there. Um, and intelligent life, if we ever encounter it, we'll almost certainly encounter it, not physically. We won't actually meet them because the distances will be too great. Um, but um, we, we're most likely to meet them through radio waves. Um, SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, where they have actual dishes pointing out, looking for signs of intelligent life. Um, I don't think it's likely to be unwise to respond to any such messages that we find, that we hear, because the distances, again, are so great. And um, you, you, we won't be able to have a conversation. I mean, even, even the nearest star um, is, is, is so far away that you could you could only send a message and then you'll all be dead before before you get with current yeah. technological yeah. levels of yeah. development wouldn't we be a little bit like the navajo sending a message in a bottle to the to well, if, spain in the yeah, 1450s if you, if, but, but but if you believe einstein um then then there is a, a, a limit to 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 
how fast information can, can travel. It's limited to the speed of light. Yes. Um, and so, um, the, the, I mean, the two science fiction books that I've read which um, come to grips with that, that problem is you, you, um, Fred Hoyle's um, A for Andromeda and uh, Carl Sagan's Contact, where um, both authors face up to the fact that um, the distances are too great for direct control of humans, for, for direct manipulation of humans. We don't have to fear that they actually come in flying saucers and, and, and run our lives. How, and you can't run people's lives by radio unless both books face this, come to the same conclusion. The, the instructions are build a computer which will then control humanity. Both authors, I don't know whether they independently thought of it or whether one of them, I forget which, which of those books came first. Um, so the, the extraterrestrial intelligence sends information telling people to build a computer which will do certain things. And the, the original senders of the information may be long dead because it takes so long for the information to get here. But once the information is here, then the computer can work in short-term time and can um, manipulate us. And, and in both cases, um, that, that, that's what a very interesting science fiction idea. Uh, and that's, I think, the only w way we need to be afraid. We're not going to be visited by people in flying saucers. That, I think, is too improbable. Richard, what an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the show. The final question we always ask is, what's the one thing we're not talking about as a society that we really should be? Well, I suppose we've sort of touched on it really. The, looking into the future, we don't know what's going to happen. And we know, looking into the past, um, that we are horrified by certain things that we did in the past, like slavery. And, and maybe what we should be doing is looking into the future and imagining what will our descendants look back at our time uh, and shudder with horror at what we did um, in the same ways we look back two or three centuries and shudder with horror. Richard, Richard, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. And please make sure to join us on our locals where we'll be carrying on with this conversation. Elon Musk is keen to escape Earth and build on Mars. As an evolutionary biologist, how do you feel about that? And what do you think establishing a successful second planet means for the human race and our evolution?